Hello everybody, welcome back to the retrospective series where I try to relay the memories of my slowly decaying mind. With this series, I'll be continuing down the line of critically analyzing some of my favorite games of all time, with the previous episode being on Kirby's Return to Dreamland. With today's episode, you already know the name of the game, it's in the title and the thumbnail, but it's on the sort of beloved Sonic the Hedgehog compact disc, or... Sonic CD for short. Creating a video essay about a Sonic game, let alone a classic game, was a bold and potentially controversial move to start with, but the decision was either to make a video on Sonic CD or Pokemon Sun, and both communities are very adamant on which games in the series are worthy or not, so this was a bold choice nonetheless. Now, keep in mind that this video essay isn't trying to persuade you or to convince the viewer that this game still, you know, stands up to its time, or is better than any of the other classic games for that matter. Rather, it's just me trying to describe my personal attachments with the game, and also give my critical opinions of the game, both for the positive and negative of Sonic CD. Because trust me, there's a lot of negative. I wasn't one of the lucky few growing up to own a Sega Genesis or the CD add-on. Rather, I found the game through a niche YouTube series from 2012 that's kind of dear to me. Mullet Mike's Creepy Gaming Series, discussing a certain screen for the game. I'd already been familiar with Sonic at that point in my life. I was practically obsessed with the character. Although, I never had any of the game consoles to play any of his games on, outside of my phone which isn't really a whole lot. I've played Sonic CD a grand total of five times, my first playthrough being on the iOS mobile port from 2011, second being on the Steam version from 2012. As of recording this video, playthroughs 3 and 4 have also been played on the Steam version, both for the bad future and true good future endings respectively. I'll get into that later. Playthrough 5 was done on the recently released Sonic Origins, so you'll be seeing gameplay mostly consisting of the Steam and Origins versions. And don't worry, I'll be talking more in depth on these versions and the developers behind it as well. But for now, feel free to kick back and relax as I take you through what is one of the most differing Sonic games that ever eluded the jaws of Genesis stardom and entered a sense of obscurity. The year is late 1991, fresh from the release of the critically acclaimed Genesis Kingpin, Sonic the Hedgehog 1. The developers at Sega knew their recently released platformer was one to clash with the likes of the legendary Super Mario, who had been rocking the 2D platformer genre by storm with titles such as Super Mario Bros. 1-3, through Super Mario Land, and Super Mario World. Lead director of Balan Wonderworld, or some may know him as one half of creating Sonic, Yuji Naka became a little unnerved with some of the company policies over at Sega. So he and roughly half of Sonic 1's dev team had moved to the US to help Sega's American district plan out the next installment of the series. With a sequel fully underway in America, back in Japan, Sega had planned on releasing a brand new add-on to the Genesis that had a faster CPU, graphical enhancements, and the biggest improvement of all being that CD-ROMs could be read on the system. And obviously with a new accessory that could push the Genesis, Sega wanted a brand new Sonic game that could both push sales and show off the console's brand new capabilities. The other half of creating Sonic, Naoto Oshima, conceived the idea that he and the remaining developers were going to make a Sonic 2 port for the CD, Master System, and Game Gear using Sonic 1's code as a base. This port would feature additional levels, a fully orchestrated soundtrack, sprite scaling effects, and animated cutscenes compared to its American counterpart. Shifting now to late 92, the sequel to Sonic the Hedgehog is released to critical acclaim once more on November 21st, 92 in Japan and November 24th, 92 in North America and Europe. 
but surprisingly, the team over in Japan had no involvement. Due to the sales of the sequel in Japan, the Japanese team had shifted their initial vision, which resulted in reworking the port they had been crafting into a brand new title under the label CD Sonic the Hedgehog. Wait, what if we like, hold on, what if we like switched around the, you know, those two there? Oh yeah, okay, that's better, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sonic CD released September 23rd, 1993 in Japan, October 1993 in Europe, and November 1993 in North America. The game sold more than 1.5 million copies worldwide, making it the CD add-on's bestseller. The game received critical acclaim worldwide, and its presentation, stories, visuals, and audio were all praised. But you'll hear more about that soon enough. Actually, right now. To live a life of power, you must have faith that what you believe is right, even if others tell you you're wrong. Right away we open up to a beautifully animated cutscene. Sonic is breezing through grassy fields and rocky terrains to make his way up to an enormous body of water called Never Lake. A certain type of a hot spot on Sonic's planet. The reason for Sonic's interest is a lush and lively planet that appears over the lake once every year for only one month, Little Planet. This planet is known for being the home of the mystical Time Stones, seven gemstones that can freely control the flow of time. When Sonic arrives, he notices that Little Planet has been stripped away entirely of its wildlife, coating the planet in a metallic finish. We can see that the planet has been chained to a nearby mountain, and to no surprise, the mountain is in the shape of a familiar foe. The sight of Robotnik makes Sonic suspect that he's behind Little Planet's sudden renovations, and after some quick mountain scaling, Sonic winds down a rocky slope, soars, and lands on the massive chain, making his way up to the planet. It's hard to begin to explain this cutscene in depth, not only because of how short it is, but just how iconic it is. This cutscene alone is what most people think of when they hear the words, Sonic CD. Previous games in the series never even had cutscenes, let alone hand-drawn animation and vocals to accompany it. But that's mostly because of the limitations of the Genesis. I won't bore you with a history lesson for too long, but after post-production with Studio Junio, which is a branch off of Studio Toei, the dev team needed to convert animation cells into a format the Mega CD could read, so obviously there were some restrictions. Graphics still needed to be passed through the system's video chip, meaning all of its variables such as colors and resolution were already predetermined. With the cutscenes needing to be compressed, combined with the limit of 16 colors per frame, it turned the end result on launch to be a bit of a mess. Yup, you are seeing this right. This was the opening cutscene on launch day and the Mega CD version. My guy Sonic is really not looking the best. And that's not like Sega's high quality talented artist doing pixel art, that is them trying to render drawings into a video chip. That's why it looks like shit. Thankfully, in later releases of the game, the cutscenes had major improvements compared to the original release. Most recently, with Origins, they fully restored the animation by upscaling the original cells, giving us a final, smooth, 60-frame product that the devs had initially visioned on the Mega CD version. It's super, super interesting to look at early developmental screenshots for the original cells online, too. As you can tell, some serious effort went into animating these segments. And thankfully, with the cells restored, we're able to get the product they wanted delivered back in 93 today. The first thing you must do to live a life of power is to find courage. Ah, chapter 3. Here's where the Mario fanboy gets to ramble about Sonic. As I stated previously, I'm not trying to convince you that CD is better than any of the other classic games, more so that I'm trying to highlight the positives, 
and convince people who haven't tried CD to actually give it a shot, despite the mixed reception it's gotten over the years. Those who've already played a classic Sonic game before will have no time adjusting to it either. Thankfully, Origins has also done CD a great pleasure of updating the game with lovely quality of life changes, making the game less of a hassle to play. Considering CD was built off of the Sonic 1 engine, most of the mechanics play similar to it with minor tweaks. The game still mostly feels like one, especially the original Mega CD version, which, depending on the player, can be a good or a bad thing. However, the Origins version brings CD up to speed with the other three classic games, handling-wise. Sonic CD has two modes, Story Mode and Time Attack, as well as four additional unlockable sub-modes. Right now, I'll only be focusing on Story Mode, as it holds the majority of the video's content and I'll save Time Attack and the other sub-modes for later on in the video. Story Mode follows Sonic's journey through the mechanized Little Planet, with the goal of stopping Robotnik's plans from eventually ruling Sonic's home with the Time Stones and restoring Little Planet to its natural self. Early on in Little Planet, Sonic comes across a female hedgehog, Amy Rose. Through extra context in CD's Japanese manual, we learn Amy came to Little Planet after predicting a destined encounter with Sonic thanks to her tarot cards. Amy immediately falls in love with Sonic in their initial interaction, but Sonic is not having it. Amy follows Sonic through Palm Tree Panic into Collision Chaos, despite Sonic not reciprocating feelings. Upon arriving in Collision Chaos, Amy is kidnapped by a new enemy, Metal Sonic, a lethal robot built in Sonic's image. Metal flees with Amy despite Sonic's attempts to save her. Now, not only does Sonic need to restore Little Planet, but also to save Amy from Metal Sonic and Robotnik, giving Sonic a handful of goals across his journey on Little Planet. <laughs> Sonic CD is a single player game, meaning any player 2s will have to sit back and relax as they watch you play through this monstrosity. Sonic controls just like he did in his previous venture. His moveset is based around momentum in a 2D environment, with movement options such as running, spin jumping, spin curling, and the newly added super peel out. And also looking up and down. Yes, this was a new feature. For those playing on modern versions of CD, spin dashing and drop dashing were added later to assist Sonic's coherency with speed, which I'll discuss later. Rings are the main collectible in CD, serving as your health bar, as if you take damage by anything at all, you'll lose your rings. Collecting 100 rings also rewards you with an extra life. You're able to find different types of monitors that assist you throughout levels too, such as ring boxes which gives you 10 rings, life boxes which reward an extra life, Shield boxes, which give Sonic an extra hit of damage. Speed shoes, which allow Sonic to move much faster for 20 seconds. And lastly, the invincibility box, which turns you invincible, also for 20 seconds. Little Planet features seven playable zones, each presenting a fresh, vibrant, colorful, 90s-esque aesthetic to it. Some that stand out to this theme are Collision Chaos, with its psychedelic sprite palette and chaotic level geometry. See what I did there? And Quartz Quadrant's perfect blend of robotics engulfed in nature and its vivid background elements accompanied by an amazing music piece. Each zone has three acts, with the third being a boss encounter with one of Robotnik's creations, giving us a total of seven bosses. Each act has an A to B style level format where you start at one side of the level and work all your way right to reach the end goalpost. You have other little things of note too, such as score, lives, and time, which solely exist because games in the 90s still followed that arcade style of format, where the player would compete for both the fastest times and the highest score. On the contrary, the game's main objectives lie within time itself. Scattered across every zone, there are signposts labeled either past or future. Running through these posts and maintaining your speed for a certain amount of time allows you to travel to a past or future variant of the zone. Here, you can explore what Little Planet looked like in its organic state with the past and its dystopian state after Robotnik's takeover with the future. 
Time travel is the key gimmick of Sonic CD. The game encourages you to explore each variant of these zones, sometimes rewarding players for their discoveries. In the past, you may come across robot generators and holograms of Metal Sonic. These two are key elements to achieving Sonic CD's good ending. That's right, multiple endings. There are two ways to obtain the good ending. Either destroying all the generators and all the holograms in the past, or obtaining all seven time stones, which automatically gives you the good ending. For the generators and holograms, you need to travel to the past and destroy them in every act of every zone. As for the time stones, you need to collect at least 50 rings and enter a giant ring at the end of the act, which leads you to a special stage. Inside this special stage, you're required to destroy 6 UFOs in under 100 seconds, and doing so rewards you with a time stone. These special stages can be tricky, as moving in a pseudo 3D environment combined with some of the intense backgrounds can be very disorienting to the player. There are many obstacles in these stages that can hinder Sonic's movement, along with an added speed buff after some UFOs are destroyed, which only adds to the difficulty. Should you collect all seven of the time stones, each future variant of any zone will now turn into a utopian good future variant, signifying that little planet has indeed been restored to its organic state. Every time I talk to my peers about CD in retrospect, I always bring up the fact that it's one of my favorite games of all time and just how amazing it is, only to reflect on those positive remarks and take away that it's based on the soundtrack and the character introductions. Because Metal Sonic is one of my favorites. So if you haven't gathered that this is going to be the critical analysis part of the video, then buckle up. I'll mostly start with the negative here, as the Christian Whitehead 2011 port was released, more people got their hands on CD and realized how it's not as pleasant of an experience as some thought the original was. The collective criticisms among the Sonic fanbase in regards to CD mostly stir up from the level design and the philosophy the developers had behind wanting an exploration-based Sonic game, which, in all fairness, is a valid criticism. The level design is probably the most joked about part of CD. To compare it now, bear with me, visualize giving, I don't know, your baby cousin access to Mario Maker for maybe five minutes, then getting the game back only to play a mishmash of blocks, enemies, and random shit everywhere. That's over 80% of CD's levels. Collision Chaos is like Oishima tossed as many level assets as he could into a washing machine and watched it crumble beneath its own weight. It's a solid criticism at best, but in comparison to Sonic 1 and 2, and even Mania, the enemy and spike placements almost feel the same, and don't stand out much as in CD. In fact, I think the real issue at play is the platforming structure, as most levels are chunky and blocky compared to the smooth rolling hills of 1 and 2 that players are used to. Another major flaw is the game's main gimmick of time traveling and the developer's approach behind it, like I mentioned previously. First of all, it's super whack there's a 10 minute time limit in levels where the main focus, at least for the good ending, is exploration. Especially since the game wants you to travel to another version of a level you're already exploring in. Sonic is a game about speed. Everybody knows that. But for them to create a central theme of exploration, which requires you to go slow, then create a central gimmick of time traveling, which requires you to go fast, under a 10 minute time limit, like... I, I just need this man to explain it. I need Oishima to explain it. And, and don't get me wrong, the concept behind seeing what Sonic levels look like in the past and future is brilliant. But, this was not the game for it. A positive note about exploration is that in some zones like Tidal Tempest Act 2, you're able to choose a route and basically hold right until you reach the goalpost. This in itself is extremely good for players who want to experience something along the lines of Sonic 1 or are just casually playing through the game. Tidal Tempest is still a large level that encourages exploration with its multiple routes, though if you want to breeze through the level, you can take those higher routes instead of having to spend time searching for the generators. And to make things better, as long as you still collect 50 rings by the end of the level, you can still go for the good ending with the time stone method. The past and future flyposts are also, like, 
extremely inconsistent too. CD's levels are already as claustrophobic as it can get, at least some of them are, but still, the game wants you to maintain speed for 5 seconds without any interruption in order to time travel, and to make it better, if you use your flag, or lose speed, then you need to find another flag post and try to time travel again in that area. Time traveling almost seems to work in complete opposite sometimes too, like sometimes you'll have more difficulty trying to go to the past and then you'll end up traveling to the future completely by accident, or some BS like this will happen. In the Christian Whitehead 2011 ports, they added spin dashing, and in Origins they added drop dashing. Both mechanics make time traveling much easier to perform, which is a lovely quality of life change that was well needed. And speaking of another change, Origins now allows you to use its new currency of coins to replay a special stage if you've lost, which I think is a fantastic thing considering a handful of players struggle with CD special stages. Back to time traveling right quick, another major issue is that 5 second window. Sometimes you try to time travel and you need to backtrack to even as far as the beginning of the zone, only because there are little to no areas in the level that allow you to time travel with ease. Meanwhile other times you'll find areas that just let you time travel for free. It's just inconsistent, and the blocky structure of the levels doesn't help its case at all. To end off this section, I'll discuss some misconceptions players may have. One I hear a little is that people will complain about the super peelout because of how vulnerable it makes you. And in comparison to the spin dash, yeah, the peelout is probably worse, but for the sake of this argument, as soon as you peel out, you can immediately curl to prevent taking damage. So I guess it's just down to preference. One more I hear frequently in videos talking about CD is people thinking you need to break the robot generators, the holograms, and obtain all the time stones in order to get the good ending. I label that as the true good ending, as you're going for every possible way to get the ending. For all the methods I've mentioned, I'd recommend going for the time stones instead of the generator method, as going for the time stones is the easiest method if you want to speed through the game or play it casually but taking whichever route you want for the good ending is entirely based on preference on how you want to play, be it through exploration or speeding through levels. Two attributes of CD that definitely stand out among the rest are the game's visual style and soundtrack. These two are easily some of the most discussed topics in regards to CD, and the game's score being the most recognizable aspect alongside the animated cutscenes. To start with the visuals, it's clear to tell that the graphics outshine Sonic 1's by a long shot. Sonic CD makes good use of the Mega CD's graphical capabilities, which is shown through the multi-layered backgrounds the game produces. The devs used a striping method, where each layer of the background and foreground were split into different sh were were split into different stri stripes of the sprite work. Try saying that ten times. This effect allowed for the final result to show depth in what was a previously flat background. The color palette of CD is also extremely vibrant and flashy, which some players have slight difficulty adapting to. Zones like Collision Chaos and Quartz Quadrant are examples of these flashier color palettes, while Wacky Workbench and Metallic Madness have sprite palettes with multiple shades of blue, making it so Sonic accidentally blends in with the backgrounds from time to time. Players obviously find that slightly disorienting, as the backgrounds are quite hectic and busy most times. A possible way to counteract this would have been to make Sonic and enemies stand out more from the backgrounds, giving them a black or white border to make them pop out more. But in all fairness, I can't really side with this argument because this game's art style, it's its just really good. As for a CD soundtrack, however, <clears throat> my god is it astonishing. Probably the most discussed part of the game. Have a listen to a track from Sonic 1. It's Springyard Zone. This track, for example, is a groovy, down-to-earth track with a nasty Genesis bass line. But that's the takeaway. Not the bass line, but obviously the score was done with the Genesis sound font in mind. But now Sega can use CDs, which give a hell of a lot more space and freedom to work for music. Sonic CD's soundtrack is mostly orchestrated, being composed by Naofumi Hataya and Masafumi Ogata for the Japanese score, and Spencer Nilsson, David Young, and Mark Crew for the American score. 
The only reason there were two different versions of the soundtrack is because Joe Miller, head of Sega of America at the time, wanted to branch off of the Japanese score. So, thanks, I guess? In Japan, Oshima envisioned CD's score to be edgy and modern, due to his perception on how Sonic was received overseas, while in the States, Miller wanted funky and quirky sounds. In the end, the JP score ended up sounding upbeat and bright, with a hint of club and techno mixed in, which was fitting for CD's mechanical theming, while the US score sounded ambient and atmospheric, with jazz thrown in. Overall, both OSTs radiated a funky, 90s-esque sound, yeah, I know, crazy. To complicate things further, each zone in the game has four versions. The present, the past, bad, and good future. Meaning that it also hosts four different music tracks to accompany it, giving us four tracks per zone and a total of 28 tracks only for the game zones. Coming back to Sonic 1's influence too, the score for the past variants were programmed using the Genesis sound font, giving it a more authentic sound to the past stages, which I just think is cool on a technical level. Coincidentally, both versions of the soundtrack also feature female vocals for the opening and ending cutscenes. In Japan, they were able to use the local talents of singer Casey Rankin and... Dear God, help me. Kaiko Utaku, who provided vocals and lyrics for Toot Toot Sonic Warrior, You Can Do Anything, and Cosmic Eternity, Believe in Yourself. The funk and jazz influences on the US soundtrack can be exemplified further through the use of the female leads from 1987's jazz group Pastiche, whose vocals are very prevalent on the iconic Sonic Boom track. To end off this long ass section, here are a selection of my favorite tracks from the game, and I'll only play a small snippet because this video is going to drag out anyways, but the soundtrack is up on streaming platforms if you're curious, and obviously, I highly recommend listening to it. You must be ready to reach beyond the boundaries of time itself. Heading back to the main story now, after Sonic defeats the... Um... The Egg Razor in Wacky Workbench, he sees himself traveling to the only coherent zone in the game, Stardust Speedway. This iconic zone is notable for its neon lights, golden brass highways, beautiful starry skies, and a stellar music piece. In the past, this zone used to be a Greek-styled city. The highways were green and full of vines and other types of vegetation, obviously being there before Robotnik's takeover. The main event of the zone lies within the third act, however, being the game's climax. Sonic's deadly race against metal. If you followed most of the steps in the good ending, then you'll be racing on the good future variant of the speedway. However, if you haven't, then you'll be on the bad future variant, which I think most players remember racing on. Sonic makes his way up to a wall where he confronts Metal. Robotnik makes his appearance, notifying Sonic that he'll be... 
He'll be- he'll be watching close by. As the race begins, the two soar through the brass highway with one of the most iconic pieces of sonic music playing in the background. Though, if you're listening to the US soundtrack, then you'll also get a pretty decent boss track that fits the race here too. As the two are neck and neck, Sonic eventually breezes past Metal, who gets smashed after he crashes into a gate closing in front of him, which then forces Robotnik to retreat. Immediately after, Sonic frees Amy, who hugs him as a thanks. And, you know, that's two birds with one stone, thankfully. But the only thing left now is to restore the Little Planet. The race against Metal Sonic is definitely the climax of Sonic CD, as most players consider Stardust Speedway to be the ending of the game, as you've beat Metal in a race, and you've also saved Amy. But, this is Sonic CD we're talking about. The game has one last trick up its sleeve in the form of Metallic Madness, the final zone of the game. And I'm not gonna talk much about the zone, as you know, it's, it's definitely cool and all with its shrinking mechanic, but some of the enemy placements and general level formatting, like the spinning wheels, the sections that force you to go painfully slow, it's, uh, it's really just not worth discussing. The level's backgrounds look pretty interesting too, but in comparison to other zones of the game, it's really hectic and busy, and you're not gonna be looking at it in awe compared to the other backgrounds. Although Sonic Mania's version of Metallic Madness really, really improved on this aspect, and makes the stage less of a pain than in CD. Although, at least the music sounds good, especially in the base version. It's easily one of the best sounding zones in all the accessible versions, so I'll give it credit. After the treacherous climb that is Metallic Madness Act 3, you know, no, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm gonna ramble real quick because this is just, like, this act is absolutely terrible. And I think everybody who's played this game will unanimously agree with me because this act just blows. You open up with a spike pit and you have the choice to either go up or down. Going up, you might get hit trying to go up, but it also leads to nowhere, forcing you to come back down. Going down, you have to do this tedious platforming section akin to Chemical Plant, and you might also get squished along the way. You might get squished again, followed by the, uh, Jesus, the worst spinning platforming challenge I've, I've ever played. This is just, it's pain. It's pain and misery. In sequence though, you can tell. Oh, you almost had it. Holy shit. Yep, death pit. Death pit. Yep. If you're playing on the console, you're back to the beginning, loser! Like, oh my god, yeah. fucking Bad. loser! Bad. <laughs> Once you finally pass that gauntlet, there's a mini boss, this little guy, whose hitbox is near impossible to hit. And, you know, on top of that, you've only got, I'd say, a handful of rings at your disposal. So if you get hit once and you lose your rings, you still have to try and fight this idiot? You see how the zone fucking blows? Like, it's. Oh, man. Anywho, after that monstrosity, that entire section, Sonic then encounters Robotnik for the last time. The final boss is Robotnik's Egg Spinner, his last attempt to defeat Sonic and conquer this timeline. This boss is a little bit of a pain, as the spinner's hitboxes can sometimes be a little disingenuous, but relatively easy to hit once you've got most of the blades destroyed and the patterns recognized. Although, it is a little anxiety endorsing when you've got like one ring left and you're also on the last blade of the spinner with Final Fever playing in the background. It's a really nice finale to the game. And to quickly touch on a note about CD's bosses, because I haven't really talked about them much, they're really weird, but are also very creative and stand out to ones compared to two and even three. Thankfully, Sonic destroys this machine, which triggers a chain reaction that causes Little Planet's metallic shell to crumble and forces Sonic to escape with Amy. The next scene I'm about to show you is the ending cutscene. I'm gonna play both versions in its entirety with the audio included too, mostly because this cutscene leaves an emotional impact on you. Well, at least it did on me.
In terms of breaking this cutscene down, we see the aftermath of the final battle as the two are fleeing the planet as it's crumbling beneath their feet. Sonic takes a leap from the planet with Amy in his arms, and they land nearby Never Lake. As Sonic takes off, we witness the giant chain break from the mountain. If you've completed the good ending, then we see Little Planet begin to rise as Sonic watches from a distance. It then shakes and disappears again for another year, leaving behind some sparkles in the shape of Sonic's face. We pan to Sonic in awe of his accomplishment as he faces the camera and strikes an iconic pose. Signifying you've completed the game with a good future, a post credit scene shows what looks to be a restored little planet with flowers blooming on the surface, featuring the text, You're Too Cool. Alternatively, if the player completes the game with a bad future, we see Robotnik attempting to flee with the Time Stone in hand, laughing maniacally. Sonic catches note of this and throws a rock as far as he can towards Robotnik, and he lands the shot alright, causing the Eggmobile to crash land as Sonic gives his pose. The post credit scene here reveals that Robotnik did in fact travel back in time using that Time Stone he had and basically resets that timeline, incentivizing to players who may not have known about the Time Stones to give the game another go through. With whichever way you've decided to play the game, that's the end of the main story. And now, all that's left to discuss are the extra game modes and the hidden unlockables. And to do that, all you need is the will to take that first step. In this last section of the video, I'll mainly be focusing on the extra game modes and other bonuses that you can find within the post game. But if you're not interested in that and just want to hear my final thoughts on the game, then feel free to go to the timestamp shown on screen right now, as that will just cover my concluding thoughts on the game to wrap up the video essay. <sighs> Still here? Alright, let's talk about that post game. Once the game is completed, you're able to access all of Time Attack. In this game mode, you can compete for your fastest individual times and an online leaderboard through the Steam and Origins versions. Time Attack is a good bit of fun, especially if you've memorized the level layouts, because you can really soar through some of these levels with the appropriate amount of practice. There's not really much replay value out of Time Attack, however, completing every zone with a combined time of under 25 minutes, you can unlock Time Attack for special stages, access the DA Garden, and visual mode. These three are a part of the extras menu, and are really just little bonuses. DA Garden is a glorified sound test, but it's, it's pretty neat, as you can mess around with this mini version of Little Planet. Following the same format, if you complete every special stage in Time Attack under 5 minutes, you unlock Stage Select, and the actual sound test. Stage Select is as you think, nothing really too interesting, as you can basically do the same thing in Time Attack. As for the sound test, it's probably the most infamous extra mode, as not only is it just a normal sound test like Sonic 1, 2, and 3, but there are also little secret images left behind by the developers for you to find. By punching in the right combinations, you're able to see these five art pieces. I'll briefly go over these, as there's nothing too special outside of one. And some know which one I'm talking about. The first hidden image is of a cute, chibi Sonic with Japanese text that roughly translates to you are cool. The artist that drew this is Masahiro Sampe, who was the landscape designer and animation visual designer for the game. The next hidden image is a parody of Batman, with Sonic depicted as a beefed up human shaped iteration of himself that's supposed to look like Batman. The text here reads, Sonic the Hedgehog, but is formatted in a way that looks similar to the Batman logo. The artist who drew this is Takumi Miyake, who was the landscape and visual designer for the game. The next hidden image is of the fastest DJ, MC Sonic. I love this image. Here we have Sonic, Metal, and Robotnik all decked out in DJ Drip. This image is dope, and I think it also comments on the style of the game soundtrack, which adds to the depth of these images in my opinion. The artist who drew this is Kazuyuki Hoshino, who was the character, special stage, and visual designer for the game. The next hidden image is of Tails, and his favorite car, the Lotus 7. The text here reads, See you next game, teasing at Tails' introduction in Sonic 2. One added bonus to this image, once you find it, is it unlocks the game's debug mode. 
The artist who drew this was Yasushi Yamaguchi, who was the character designer for Tails, and the special stage designer for Sonic CD. The second to last hidden image is concept art of an unused zone in the game. This zone is called Desert Dazzle, one of two scrap stages that were planned to be released in the original version and in the 2011 version. The image is signed by the head developer for the 2011 version, Christian Whitehead. According to Whitehead, the zone was cut so that the game didn't stray too far from its original form. However, the level's assets and ideas were then used once more and brought to new life in Sonic Mania, taking the form of Mirage Saloon Zone. As for the final hidden image, this one is the most well-known out of the bunch, and you'll soon see why. Remember earlier in the video, like towards the beginning, when I mentioned Mullet Mike's creepy gaming channel? That was my introduction to Sonic CD, and it was all thanks to this one image he covered on that YouTube series. So, you know, enough rambling, without further ado, here's what I witnessed at like 11 years old. Viewing this image past the age of like, I don't know, 15 is probably not going to disturb you the way it did back when I and many others discovered it when they were much younger and much more innocent. And no, I never like pissed myself looking at this as I would any other creepypasta from this era, but I'll tell you, there are some kids who played Sonic CD when this came out in 93, long before the internet was able to capitalize on the creepiness of this image and seriously got a fright from this. And it doesn't help that in the US OST, which everyone in North America and Europe was listening to, played the boss track. And that only adds to the level of disturbance this image gives off. To dive a little deeper, the Japanese text here reads, Infinite Fun, or Fun is Infinite, Sega Enterprises, signed by Mazin Picture. The artist who drew this was Masato Nishimura, the landscape designer of Sonic CD. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time, but I wanted to highlight this section only because of this picture. You can look into this image more, as there are a multitude of videos on this website talking about this image, but needless to say, it's a little... disturbing. Also, inputting three sevens on the sound chest allows you to play on the secret special stage, an unused special stage with Robotnik's head in the background. Just a little hidden extra I thought was worth mentioning. Yeah, that was, um, that was Sonic CD. I hope you guys, um, enjoyed my rambling for this game for like an hour. <laughs> uh, that basically concludes the gist of what Sonic CD has to offer. It's not the best game in the world, but it's one that I cherish greatly and I think is one that should be recognized more often, mostly because of the developers who poured out their creativity with this game. I find CD is so unique compared to the other three classic games, it just stands out from the rest. Like the runt of a litter almost. Staying on topic with the classics, Oshima surprisingly does not consider CD to be a sequel to Sonic 2 as some fans thought it was, although Yamaguchi said that the ending of CD might make players think that the story is set between Sonic 1 and Sonic 2, which turned out to be entirely correct, going off of the order in which you play through the classics in Sonic Origins, confirming that timeline correction. Sonic CD has also had multiple influences on future Sonic titles, where Metal Sonic and Little Planet make some notable appearances. Metal Sonic remains antagonistic with his roles from Knuckles Chaotix, Sonic Heroes, Sonic Generations, Sonic 4 Episode 2, Sonic Mania, and Sonic Forces. Little Planet also makes some appearances in Sonic 4 Episode 2, and a little more notably in Sonic Mania. The most notable influence the game has had is undoubtedly the Sonic OVA, made in 1996, which takes direct narrative cues from the plot of CD and expands upon them through watching Robotnik create Metal and the rivalry that spawns between Sonic and Metal. But that's not going to help you since I know everything you're going to do. Strange, isn't it? The movie features Tails and Knuckles as prominent characters too, but the overarching plot takes heavy inspiration from CD's plot. It's just a great watch if you haven't seen it already. Sonic CD has extremely good ideas. Just, um... Poor execution due to time constraints thanks to Sonic 2's popularity and success, and also Sonic 3's upcoming release at the time. 
I'd recommend it for fans of Sonic who haven't given the game a shot before, for fans of 2D platformers who both enjoy an easy and challenging experience, and for someone who just hasn't played Sonic. It was my first Sonic game, and I still think it plays like shit, but that doesn't mean that I don't love it. The game pushes the limits of level design complexity, surreal color schemes, and a level of musical and graphical polish that was just not seen in the previous game and continues to impress even to this day. And with that, thank you for watching. I hope that I shed some light on this obscure yet cherished platformer. I'm gonna end off the video with an artwork showcase that I've gathered from the past year on Twitter. And don't worry, I've credited all the artists both in the description of this video and in a Google Doc that's attached in the description. I'm not an asshole, I just, I want to express my love for this game. Once again, thank you for watching. If you are interested in continuing to watch these critical analysis videos that analyze my favorite games of all time, or if you're interested in watching more shorter yet informative videos, then feel free to like and subscribe. Honest to God, it seriously helps me out in the long run as your feedback, both in the form of just watching this video or any type of feedback, regardless positive or negative, really helps me like it really helps me figure out how I want to go about creating content going forward in the future. Either way, feedback is just really well appreciated and you just watching this video today is more than enough to inspire me to continue going forward. And um, with that, this is XSword64 signing off.